Okay, so we don't have liquid nitrogen, so, but we do have an introductory video to help sell, explain what we're going to be talking about today. Let's start with a quick story. This is a self-portrait of Sergei Prokudin-Gorsky, one of the earliest pioneers of color photographs. The Tsar of Russia was so blown away by Gorsky's three-color method that he gave him a train car to use as a portable darkroom and sent him out to take color photographs all across Russia. He traveled around like this for about six years, taking thousands of incredible photographs of Russia during what turned out to be the eve of World War I and the Russian Revolution. Gorsky fled Russia. And the only reason these images survived is because they were rushed into a box and speared it across Europe to some basement in Paris. Now, they represent one of our only glimpses into this incredible world of the early 1900s Russian Empire. About half of his photo negatives were confiscated by the Russian government before he could leave and were probably destroyed. We'll never know what the other pictures looked like. They were swallowed up by the chaos of an uncertain and rapidly changing era. These days, we're all Gorsky, documenting our lives and our world obsessively, creatively, but much more casually. When we take a picture, record a video, or send an email, do you really expect it to last anywhere close to 100 years, like Gorsky's delicate glass slides? The cloud is just someone else's computer taking up acres of land, consuming cities worth of power, and billions of dollars in cost of ownership. And it ties the fate of our data with the economic fate and privacy policies of a provider. Not to mention generating more carbon emissions every year than the entire airline industry. And as you might have noticed, we're in the middle of an explosion of data creation. The amount of data that we produce each year as a species is growing exponentially, while our storage capacity is not. Hard drives are not going to keep getting smaller. We've basically reached the physical limits of that. Data centers and data storage warehouses are just going to have to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and just multiplying across the face of the earth in order to keep up with the amount of data that we are generating. On top of all the space, energy, and money that our data is sucking up, there are some serious concerns about the integrity of our archival materials in the long term. Hard drives need to be replaced about once every five years, and magnetic tape can last maybe 30. So do you really think that your data is going to last for posterity if it's stored on stuff that goes bad so frequently and goes out of date even more often? Think 100 years down the line. What about 500? What about even 50? All this stuff put together has created this looming slow motion crisis. We kind of need to figure this out. And it turns out the answer has been with us since the very beginning, literally. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of information packed into that little two minute video there. Um, DNA storage sounds like science fiction. Why do we want to store data in DNA? Yeah, so the, the problem that we're facing, as, as was briefly covered by the video, is that we're on track to generate a lot more data than we'll have the ability to store. Of course, not all data that we generate is useful enough for us to store, but by about 2025, we're on track to generate 160 zettabytes of data. So that's about 10 times the number of bytes as there are stars in the observable universe. And uh, about 40% of that is estimated to be useful for enterprise operations. The problem is we'll only have the ability to store about 12.5% of that using conventional medium like hard drives and magnetic tape. So uh, there is a very strong need for a new medium that can store all the useful data that we're going to be generating. So instead of encoding ones and zeros magnetically or in a, in a solid state chip, we're going to encode it in the base pairs of DNA, and that's the idea. That's the general idea, but uh, you know, we are still encoding uh, the ones and zeros that was the, the form of digital data. We're just putting it in the form of DNA, in, in molecular, in a very physical sense. So when, when um, the idea of DNA storage was first mooted in about 1964, as I understand it, there was no way to be able to do this at all, and the early attempts in recent years were very much like a hard drive a way of doing things. A, a single bit was encoded as a particular base pair combination in some synthetic DNA. But your technology for catalog is very different. And I think, I think you can tell a, a story about why the idea came from for your company and what makes it different. Sure, I'll try to yeah. get to all of those. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the idea of storing information in DNA has been around for a very long time uh, because of the inherent characteristics of DNA. 
the information density of the material is incredibly large. So you can store about 200 petabytes per gram of DNA. Um, and the, the stability of the molecule is also incredibly long. So you can store information for thousands of years if you were to put it in DNA. And also, this is something that nature has evolved to copy and spread around across the world. So to have thousands of redundancies in your data uh, is very straightforward. So that has interesting implications for decentralized data storage as well. But because of these characteristics, even before the discovery of the molecule, or the structure of the molecule, rather, the idea of storing artificial digital data in DNA uh, has been conceived of. The first person to actually do it was back in the 80s, an artist named Joe Davis, uh, in collaboration with a group at Harvard Medical School. Uh, but really, doing this at massive scale, there's the bottleneck has been the cost of synthesizing DNA. Mm -hmm. so, so as you mentioned, the previous approach to storing information in DNA has been about mapping the ones and zeros into the linear sequence of the base pairs, the four different flavors of the molecules, and then uh, synthesizing enough molecules to store all the numbers that you want to represent using these base pairs. But we came up with a, a different approach, uh, my co-founder and I, uh, using enzymes to assemble a lot of different molecules from a small subset of pre-made molecules. Mm -hmm. So you can think of them as sort of type phases, you know, whereas um, just synthesizing a lot of DNA might be like copying down the information using a pen and paper. If you had pre-made DNA molecules like type phases and have the ability to just rearrange them into trillions of combinations, it's a much faster and cheaper way to go about it. And that the speed and the efficiency of being able to do that is actually what sets you apart from, from previous efforts. Because, I mean, there was a famous uh, game, if you like, at Davos a few years ago where they gave out uh, a Bitcoin encoded in DNA. And they, the first person to successfully decode the DNA won the Bitcoin, as it were. But that was, it cost thousands and thousands of dollars just to create that initial tiny little bit of data storage. Right, right. And, uh, Microsoft uh, published on their work back in 2016, mm. of, uh, which set the record for the most amount of data stored in DNA. That was for 200 megabytes, uh, and it came at a cost of about $800,000. So uh, at that rate, you know, storing a terabit of information would be a few billion dollars. Um, so we really wanted to address the cost problem as well as the speed. And so we're on track to build a, uh, a large machine that's dedicated to writing information in DNA. Uh, and by early next year, we'll be able to do a terabit in 24 hours for a few thousand dollars. And for people out here who are thinking about storing DNA, we, we carry around devices in our pockets that have gigabytes of storage, and we're used to that. And it's hard, and we understand that we have hard drives in our computers. But the machine you're building is not a, a portable device by any sense, is it? It's a, a large scale. Can you give us a sense of how big it is? And, and how long the process takes? Sure. So MIT Tech Review recently covered uh, the, the development of the machine, and they called it a school bus. <laughs> we decided to really own that, but uh, call it a party bus. So it's going to be about 10 meters long, uh, about uh, 3 meters across. So it's an industrial scale facility. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Uh, but it's a first generation machine. We haven't really tried to, uh, to miniaturize it at, at, at all. And again, this is something that writes the information into DNA, and the output is, is a very small pellet of DNA that you can archive. Mm -hmm. How long is your machine going to take to, say, encode a petabyte or a terabyte of data? Can you give us a sense of the timing? How long would it take? Yeah. Right, so uh, with that machine that we're building currently, we'll be able to do uh, 24 hours for a, a terabit. And that will be the first quarter of next year. And how quickly is that terabit then readable? So reading is a separate problem, and it's done by sequencing. And uh, we're using completely synthetic DNA. It's not something that we purify from a human body or, or other animals. But uh, in the end, the molecules look identical from the molecules that may have come from a human body. So it's the same sequencing process where uh, you might get your genome sequenced with the company. And that uh, process has been evolving faster than Moore's law since 2008. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I think companies like Lumina are advertising that they'll be able to sequence an entire human genome in under an hour uh, for about $100 in the next few months. <laughs> uh, and so we're very excited to see that pro progress. Uh, and there are also next generation uh, platforms out there, beyond next generation platforms out there, that could work even better for data retrieval purposes. So this sets up a picture immediately of DNA storage as kind of archival quality, for now at least. It takes a long time to encode the data, but then it persists in DNA form. And if you wanted to, you could leave it stored like the seed archive in, 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 the, in the far north. Right. So uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, we're looking at archival applications for DNA in the beginning because of the slower read and write times, which will improve over time. Uh, but the, the major advantage there is really the information density and the stability. So we're talking about uh, 200 petabytes per gram, or if you're talking about a sugar cube's worth of DNA, that's about five grams, so an exabyte. And uh, an exabyte. as we talked about Sounds backstage, an exabyte yeah. is about 58,000 years worth of 1080p uh, high, high definition video. 58,000 years. Right, and that's about the capacity of a large data center. In something uh, this big. Right, and you could carry that around with you in your pocket. Um, and, and because of the stability of the molecule, and the fact that it's in DNA is very interesting because you can always, as long as our genomic information is stored in DNA, we'll always be able to read it back. So uh, there isn't a planned obsolescence in this medium. So you'd never have to worry about migrating the, the material, the data from one form of DNA to another. Whereas that is the case with sort of our go-to medium now for archival magnetic tape. So a yeah. new generation comes out every two or three years. So even though the lifetime of the tape is about 30 years or, or less, you have to keep migrating it to new generations because the tape drives that read uh, the tape can only go back two generations prior. Mm -hmm. And so the total cost of ownership of maintaining a tape library is actually, the uh, majority of it goes to the labor cost. NASA, for example, lost countless amount of data because its tapes themselves disintegrated before they could even read them off. Right, right, yeah. Um, disintegration of the media is also a problem. So if you don't migrate it in time to new generations, then you have to worry about that as well. Yeah. So this is not, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, encoding data in DNA. But I mean, my, uh, my favorite writer, Douglas Adams, has a great example. The Encyclopedia Galactica was a book that was so large, it required several buildings to carry it around in. And then they developed nanoscale memory, which you could fit in your pocket. And that's equivalent to almost exactly what you're trying to do, isn't it? To encode incredible amounts of information in a very small, persistent way. Yeah, exactly. And because of those characteristics, archival stores might not be the only thing that uh, matters, that, uh, that works for DNA. So imagine having the access to all of your health information with you in a small pellet uh, that you carry around underneath your skin. That way, you don't have to store your health information up in the cloud where it can be hacked, but it will always be accessible to you when you visit the doctor because all hospitals have sequencers now. So the, uh, if you've seen the movie Gattaca, you know, Vincent yes. uses a fingertip sachet to gain access to the facilities. It could be a very similar process when you go to the hospital. You prick your finger to get the bit of DNA that's encoding your health information, and you don't have to fill out any forms. <laughs> and of course, the advantage of DNA is that it's easy to copy. So you can, once you've encoded uh, what your personal data, for example, in that pellet you're talking about, it's relatively easy to replicate the string of data. It's much simpler than actually encoding it in the first place. Exactly. Uh, if you look at your body, you have 30 trillion cells plus cells, and so you have 30 trillion copies of your genetic information. And it doesn't cost that much to, uh, to copy the information. So actually having a thousand different copies of, the, of a data center isn't going to cost much more than having just one copy. Mm. So that has really interesting implications, I think, in the context of, say, decentralized storage of uh, blockchain ledgers. Ah, of course. Very hot topic, of course. Um, there's no ethical consideration to be to be aware of because when you, people say DNA, it's a, it's a trigger word, and, and, and nowadays we're aware of our own privacy and our own data. But you use synthetic DNA, 
Right. Uh, one of the most con common questions I get is whose DNA are you using? Yeah. <laughs> is it yours? <laughs> And my answer to that would normally be, don't worry about it, we hire the best interns and we let them play outside. But no, it's not uh, any biological DNA, it's just synthetic DNA. Uh, but in the end, it looks very much like biological DNA so that enzymes can recognize it and copy it and so forth. But when it comes to privacy concerns, I think it also has really interesting implications because right now, if you have a petabyte of data, uh, a thousand terabytes, and you want to store it somewhere and you're just an individual, there is really no good way to store it but to give it to a, a storage provider, a cloud provider. Uh, but with DNA, if it's a matter of just maintaining the small pellet uh, less than a gram, then that becomes possible to own large amounts of data, physically own it, and have complete control over how that is dealt with. Mm. The statistic that I read was the most interesting about this particular thing is that we're generating so much data now, as your video shows, that in 40 years, inside 40 years, we won't be able to mine enough silicon to create the chips to store that information. So literally, we are at a point of inflection where we're going to have to start looking for more dense ways to store information. Right, so that, that statement had a lot to do with the fact that a lot of our storage is going to solid state drives. Mm. And that's what uh, you need really high quality uh, silicone for. And uh, in about 40 years, the estimate is that we won't have enough high quality polycrystalline silicone uh, f to make all the, the chips that we want. And that leads on to the very next point, is that mining silicon and maintaining a data center and powering a data center and then making sure you have secure backups takes a lot of raw energy. So can we say that DNA storage is a green technology? Can you, can you talk about how much energy it takes to? Sure. So I think data centers take up uh, anywhere on the order of a few megawatts to a, a few hundred megawatts of power. It's like a small city. Uh, I think a lot of these big IT companies are doing a great job of trying to offset that carbon uh, footprint by investing in uh, uh, more sustainable power generation. Mm -hmm. But if you were using less from the beginning, that would be a better thing to do. And with DNA, it's, it's a totally inert medium once you have store the information into DNA. And the process of writing it into DNA is also very power efficient. Uh, so. Um, I think the video talked about the, the, the data centers generating more carbon emissions than all of the uh, air flight uh, industry put together. Uh, but it'll be interesting if we can actually decrease that amount by incorporating, offloading some of that uh, storage into medium like DNA. And there's a pleasant irony in the fact that you're using biological system to protect a biological system in a way. Uh, there's even further to that point one of the biggest drivers of data creation right now is genomic sequencing. So, uh, and we'd love to store that information in DNA. So uh, my goal is to be able to sequence all of the genome of the people here and put it straight back into DNA for storage. <laughs> <laughs> um, this technology is, is in its infancy, but it has a trajectory. Can you, can you imagine in 10 years' time what a DNA storage marketplace will be like. Right. If we think about uh, my company's sort of trajectory, we've done our fir very first proof of concept by encoding a kilobit of data. That was the road not taken, the poem by Robert Frost. Second thing we did was at megabit levels, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, <laughs> the novel. And then uh, we're on track to do a terabit per day early next year. But this machine is with the design in mind of encoding, uh, of further scaling that up three orders of magnitude. So within about three years from next year, we'll be able to do petabits per day. And so I think that's a relevant scale to really launch uh, an industrial service for uh, storing people's data into DNA. And if we imagine that we can install, we could store all the data that humankind's ever created in a, in a box of DNA, how, how big would that be? Any ideas? Is it size of me, the size of a, a van. So if you really think about the 30 trillion cells that we have, 30 plus, and all the microorganisms that uh, exist on our 
coexist in our body that actually outnumbers the, the human cells. We carry around enough DNA, each of us, to store all of the data that we've ever generated so far. So if, uh, but that would only be in one copy. Uh, uh, but keep in mind, you know, we're not all DNA. We're mostly water and empty space. So if you were to uh, encode all of the information in the world uh, and put it into DNA, it would probably fit in a shoebox. A shoebox. That's just insanely cool. <laughs> a, more, a more interesting question is, how do you make sure that the code is readable in the future? Do you build in resiliency to the, the way you encode information so that someone discovers a box of goo on a shelf in a thousand years, they'll be able to work out how to do it? Right, so the, the hope is that humanity will survive until then so that uh, we, we still have the ability to read back DNA. <laughs> uh, we'll have to see the results of the elections first. But uh, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so there, there's many levels to answering that question. So we'll always have the ability to read back DNA, uh, the sequence of the base pairs. To now get that, that from that to the, the, base, the binary code, that's an encoding problem. And so we have to work with archivists to figure out a way to really make this self-decoding so that people that have lost track of the metadata or the, the indexing or the key to this can come back, sequence the DNA, and have the, the data make sense for them. But it's not something that's necessary for all the data that we'd be storing, but just for things that we really want to have archived for, for perpetuity. It's a bit like the, um, the Voyager of right, right. the yep. data encoding and the message, the RCA, RCA message that we sent out to the stars. We encoded in it the instructions how to decode it. Right. Uh, of course, it's, there's always another level up. So. How are we going to put that information? Is it going to be in a picture that can be decoded by an alien life form? But it's an interesting problem to think about. Fantastic. I mean, the, the, the most important takeaway from, from this talk is that this is not science fiction. This is, this is science fact. And your machine will be up and running commercially inside a few years, I understand? Right. So uh, the terabit per level per day uh, machine, that will be used for pilot projects with large partners uh, next year. And then we'll hope to have the industrial scale service launched in about two or three years from that. Fantastic. Well, thanks for the great introduction to this astonishing technology. Thanks, thanks everyone. So much.